In October of 2004, a 15-year-old girl suddenly woke up in the middle of the night in a total panic. She didn't know where she was, and it was so dark in the room she couldn't see anything. And when she tried to move, she realized she couldn't. She was paralyzed. She tried to calm down and just listen for some sign of where she was or what was going on, but all she could hear were the unfamiliar sounds of machines beeping and whirring. Then the horror sunk in. She was locked inside of her own body, and she had no idea why. From Ballin Studios and Wondery, I'm Mr. Ballin, and this is Mr. Ballin's Medical Mysteries, where every week we will explore a new baffling mystery originating from the one place we all can't escape, our own bodies. If you like today's story, please invite the follow button to an overnight paranormal investigation at an abandoned hospital, and after you get inside, tell them you need to use the bathroom, but just proceed to leave and lock all the doors. This week's story is called Silent Scream. On a Monday morning in October of 2004, 15-year-old Gina Giese rode the bus to school in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, a suburb about an hour outside of Milwaukee. As the bus hit a pothole, she felt her stomach lurch. She'd had a stomach ache all morning and barely touched the toast her mom handed her for breakfast. Normally, Gina would have taken any excuse to miss school on a Monday, but today was different. It was the start of homecoming week at St. Mary Springs High School, and she had been looking forward to it since the end of summer vacation. It was also her first year on the varsity volleyball team, which was a big deal for a sophomore. Gina didn't want to miss practice for the big game against their rival school, which was taking place that Thursday. As the bus pulled into the school parking lot, Gina convinced herself that she'd feel fine once she saw her friends and got to class. But the moment she stood up from her seat, she felt heavy and sluggish. It was like an invisible weight was trying to pull her through the floor. It took all her energy just to make it to English class. She spent the rest of the day fighting to keep her eyes open until it was finally time to go home. Later that night, while watching TV, Gina felt her arm start to tingle. She shook it, but the tingling wouldn't go away. Gina decided that she was probably just fighting off a flu bug, and so she just needed a good night's rest. And so she went to bed, and it didn't take long for her to fall into a deep sleep. But when she woke up the next morning, she didn't feel any better. In fact, as the week went by, Gina still just did not get any better. By Thursday, she was still exhausted and feeling achy. But today was the day of her big volleyball game, and Gina was not going to miss it. She dragged herself out of bed, but when she reached for her robe, her arm felt like it was made of lead. But she shook it off and took a deep breath, and then headed to the bathroom. A few hours later, Gina took her spot on the volleyball court. She felt a bit queasy, but she chalked it up to pregame nerves. The stands were full of supporters chanting and eager to cheer her team on. Once the game started, the opposing team served the ball over the net. One of Gina's teammates got underneath it, lobbing the ball towards Gina and setting her up for an easy play. All she had to do was spike it over the net. But as the ball got closer to her, her vision suddenly doubled. She was seeing two white volleyballs sailing toward her face. Gina blinked, unsure of which one to hit. She leaped up, swatting at the air, and her palm did make contact with the hard vinyl ball, and immediately a jolt of pain shot through her arm. But she didn't care, because she had done her job and returned the ball. The other team dove for it and missed. As the ball fell to the floor, the stands erupted. Gina had scored. She smiled and blinked a few times, a moment later, her double vision had cleared, and she breathed a sigh of relief. She was on a roll for the rest of the game. After the game, Gina went out with her teammates for some celebratory ice cream. By the time she got home, she had forgotten all about the double vision from the start of the game. Her arm was a little stiff from hitting so many balls, but she felt better. The next morning, Gina slept through her alarm and woke up late. She tried to get up, but her entire body was so achy and stiff. Her forehead was hot, but her teeth were chattering, and she was thirsty. She desperately needed a glass of water. Gina swung her legs over the side of the bed, then lurched forward to stand up, and nearly fell over sideways. It wasn't that her body felt limp. It was like her joints were so stiff she couldn't move them so she couldn't walk. 
She felt like a mechanical doll whose battery had run out. Gina fell back into bed and called her dad, John, for help. John ran upstairs and came over to help his daughter out of bed. Gina threw her arm around his shoulder and he propped Gina up onto her feet. Then John walked her down the hallway to the bathroom. Even though he tried to look calm, Gina could see the fear in her father's eyes. She tried to thank him for helping, but it was like talking with a mouthful of peanut butter. Her brain knew the words, but her tongue just couldn't keep up. That's when her dad yelled out to her mom, Anne, and said to get Gina's pediatrician on the phone right away. Anne got an appointment and helped John get Gina into her jacket, and then they guided her out to the car. Gina could barely put one foot in front of the other. But on the way to the doctor, something even more frightening happened to Gina. Her left arm just started jerking uncontrollably, and so her mom held Gina's other hand, looking totally panicked and afraid. Gina's mind was so foggy she could barely process what was going on. Less than an hour later, Gina was at her pediatrician's office. The doctor put her through blood tests, a CT imaging scan, and an MRI. Once those were all done, they sent her to an examination room to wait for the results. Gina shivered as she sat on the thin paper stretched out over the doctor's examination table. Her arm still shook uncontrollably, and her parched mouth was filled with saliva. She had been drinking water, but nothing could quench her thirst. Eventually, there was a knock at the door, and Gina's doctor walked into the room. He had a calm demeanor, but Gina could see in his eyes that something was clearly wrong. He told Gina and her parents that there was clearly something going on to make Gina extremely sick, but he just didn't know what it was yet. Gina's blood work came back fine. The neurologist couldn't find anything on her CT scans either. Gina didn't understand what this all meant, but she was scared. She could feel drool leaking out the side of her mouth, but she couldn't muster enough energy to make it stop. The doctor handed Anne a tissue, and Gina felt her mother's hand gently wipe it away. The doctor said that Gina needed to see a specialist at a larger hospital in Milwaukee, 70 miles away, and she had to get there fast. Minutes later, Gina was loaded into the back of an ambulance. Her parents held her hand and promised they'd follow right behind. During the ride to the hospital, Gina felt dizzy, so she leaned her head back against the stretcher she was strapped to and closed her eyes. She hoped that this next doctor would have an answer and she'd feel better soon. Despite the sound of the blaring siren, Gina could barely keep her eyes open and she quickly fell asleep. The next thing that Gina remembered was waking up in a stark white hospital room with fluorescent ceiling lights that hurt her eyes. A nurse came in to check Gina's blood pressure. She asked if Gina could stand up. Gina slid off the hospital bed and for a moment she stood perfectly still. Then her body started jerking violently. The nurse caught her before she fell to the ground and helped her into a wheelchair. When Gina sat down, her eyesight became blurry again. It was like she was looking at the nurse through a sheet of wax paper. But even still, Gina could make out the nurse's sympathetic expression. The nurse told Gina not to worry. The neurologists would have her test results soon. Dr. Rodney Willoughby was in his office when Gina's test results arrived a few minutes later. He read and reread the results a dozen times. He was the lead doctor on Gina's case, and he needed to be absolutely certain of what he was seeing. He'd been a doctor for over 20 years, but this was his first time encountering a case like this. And now he was about to deliver the most tragic diagnosis of his career. With a heavy heart, he left his office and walked into the small room where Gina's parents were waiting. Anne and John both stood to greet him, looking hopeful. Dr. Willoughby sighed and broke the news. Gina had contracted a fast-moving fatal disease that killed almost 60,000 people every year. And while there was a vaccine, Gina was now too far gone for it to work. No one in recorded history had ever survived once this disease progressed this far. Dr. Willoughby told Gina's parents that over the next 24 to 48 hours, Gina's organs would fail and her heart would stop. At this point, the only thing they could do was keep her comfortable until she died. Judging from Anne and John's blank expressions, Dr. Willoughby could see that his horrific words had not sunk in yet. Then Anne collapsed into her husband, sobbing. John begged Dr. Willoughby for a solution. There had to be something they could do. But Dr. Willoughby just shook his head. There was no beating this disease. 
He stood with Gina's parents while they grieved, then gave them privacy to sit with their daughter. By this point, Gina was drifting in and out of consciousness. Dr. Willoughby could tell she wasn't coherent enough to understand what was happening to her. It was heartbreaking to know there was nothing he could do to help her. But throughout the afternoon, Dr. Willoughby was finding it harder and harder to accept Gina's fate. He called the CDC before he left the office. He knew the chances were slim, but he wanted to know if there was any new or promising research that could save Gina's life. They said no. But Dr. Willoughby was not satisfied. So he decided to do some digging of his own. Later that night, he poured over a stack of medical studies and published research. For hours, he flipped through page after page of the same grim findings, drinking coffee to keep himself awake. Finally, sometime past midnight, an autopsy report caught his eye. Until that point, most of the medical community assumed that Gina's disease caused organ failure by eating away at the brain. But this report suggested that wasn't actually true. The pathogens left the brain completely intact. Instead, the virus kills by disrupting the brain's ability to regulate necessary body functions like respiration and heart rate. That's what causes the body to shut down and die, but not by damaging the brain itself. Dr. Willoughby was even more fascinated by what he read next. The autopsy showed that just before each of these victims died, their immune systems actually began to fight back. That meant that the disease was beatable. It just caused organ failure too quickly for the immune system to react. Dr. Willoughby wondered if there was a way to temporarily shut down Gina's brain activity without killing her. If this could be done, her brain would be protected from the deadly viral attack. The pathogens would be prevented from causing her brain to malfunction and destroy her body. This would give her immune system time to produce antibodies and fight off the virus. That's when Dr. Willoughby came up with a radical idea. It was Gina's only hope. Gina's mother, Anne, was filled with dread as she and her husband walked into Dr. Willoughby's office the next morning. She was expecting a discussion on how to prepare for Gina's death. But when they sat down in front of the pediatrician, he told them about the shocking information he'd found the night before. At first, Anne began to feel some hope, but as the doctor went through the details of his plan, she felt like she'd fallen back into a nightmare. After the doctor was done explaining his radical plan, Anne just stared at him in disbelief. The doctor wanted to put Gina into a deep, medically-induced coma to take her an inch from death to the point that her brain was completely silent. She would have no thoughts and no signals to the rest of her body. Gina would be kept alive by machines. She would need to be kept in the coma for at least 10 days, hopefully long enough to fight off what was attacking her body. Dr. Willoughby admitted they would be gambling with Gina's life. No one had ever attempted anything like this before. If it didn't work, Gina would surely die. And even if the doctor's plan worked and Gina's body managed to fight off the disease, there was no guarantee that she would even wake up from the medically induced coma. Her brain might never be able to regain its proper functions and she would be left in a vegetative state dependent on machines to keep her alive for the rest of her life. The thought of that sent a shiver down Anne's spine. But if they wanted to save her daughter's life, this was their only option. Anne looked to John, and he nodded. And so, with all the courage she could muster, Anne gave Dr. Willoughby the go-ahead. On October 10th, Dr. Willoughby and a surgical team gathered in the operating room. Gina was brought in, and the anesthesiologist administered drugs to induce a medical coma. The coma would help to regulate her routine brainstem functions, such as breathing and circulation. After the procedure was completed, Gina was wheeled back to the ICU. Dr. Willoughby barely left the hospital for the next few days. He would walk by Gina's room and hear the steady sounds of the machines that had taken over her body functions. He would see her parents were praying at her bedside. Dr. Willoughby prayed silently for Gina, too. Ten days passed. The waiting was unbearable. Dr. Willoughby spent every moment anxiously hoping this treatment would work, and Gina's parents spent every possible second by their daughter's bedside. Finally, it was time to take her out of the coma and see if her body had been able to fight off this disease. 
Throughout the day, Dr. Willoughby lessened the amount of drugs that were keeping Gina asleep. If everything had worked, she'd soon be able to wake up on her own. But as the hours ticked by, the monitor tracking her brain activity was still a flat line. This was a bad sign. If the monitor didn't start showing something soon, Gina might never wake up. When Dr. Willoughby came into work early the next morning, he ran to Gina's room and checked her brain activity monitor again. The screen showed a flat line with the tiniest blips of movement on it. That meant Gina's brain was working. Dr. Willoughby breathed a sigh of relief. He couldn't believe that his plan might actually work. But Gina still had not actually woken up from the coma. When Anne and John arrived at the hospital later that morning, Dr. Willoughby led them over to Gina's bedside. He positioned Anne right over Gina's face. Then he opened Gina's eyes with a speculum, which is a tool eye doctors typically use to keep patients from blinking. Dr. Willoughby watched Gina's pupils flood with light, going big as saucers. Then they started to move. Gina was awake. Dr. Willoughby could see her eyes darting from right to left, looking all around the room, and then finally her eyes settled on her mother's face. Gina's pupils went wide with recognition, and Dr. Willoughby knew she had recognized her mom. Anne realized it too. She flashed Dr. Willoughby a grateful smile, her eyes welling with tears, and Dr. Willoughby breathed a huge sigh of relief. He took out his reflex hammer and tapped Gina's knee. But to his surprise, she didn't flinch. He tried again, but there still was no reaction. Dr. Willoughby's stomach turned. Even if Gina was still groggy, her body should have naturally had a reflex. He tried to keep a neutral expression, but he knew Anne and John could tell something was wrong. He didn't know how to tell them that Gina was awake, but physically she was paralyzed. She was literally locked inside of her body. The condition is actually called being, quote, locked in, and it's a rare disorder of the nervous system. People with locked-in syndrome are paralyzed except for the muscles that control eye movement. They're conscious and can think and reason. They can hear and see, but they can't move or speak, and they can't chew, swallow, or breathe on their own. And there was nothing Dr. Willoughby could do to help Gina. Their only hope was to wait and see if anything changed. That night, as he drove home, Dr. Willoughby prayed to God for forgiveness. He felt like he had sentenced Gina to a fate worse than death. She could spend the next 60 years as a prisoner in her own body, able to think and reason and feel, but never move. He could imagine how terrifying it would be for Gina to be going through this after almost dying of a deadly disease. When Dr. Willoughby returned to the hospital the next day, nothing had changed. Gina's eyes darted around the room, but her body remained motionless on the hospital bed. And the day after that was exactly the same. On the third morning after Gina had woken up, Dr. Willoughby arrived at the hospital full of dread. He stopped at Gina's room first and grabbed her chart from its holder on the door. Then he walked to Gina's bedside and removed the reflex hammer out of his breast pocket. Holding his breath, he gave her knee a soft tap. Gina flinched. A short time later, Anne and John arrived in Gina's room and Dr. Willoughby excitedly asked them to watch as he tapped Gina's knee. Again, her muscles contracted, and Gina's parents went wide-eyed. After two weeks of surviving on slim threads of hope, they started crying, this time out of joy. Three months later, Gina took a deep breath and opened her eyes. She was back home in her bedroom. Even though she'd left the hospital a week ago, she still worried that she'd wake up in that awful bright white hospital room, hooked up to machines, unable to move. Coming out of the coma had felt like being underwater. She could hear the muffled voices of people she knew and see the blurry outlines of their faces. But it wasn't until Dr. Willoughby pried her eyes open that she finally broke through the surface. It had taken days for the feeling to return to her body. First, she was able to flutter her eyelids, then she was able to twitch her fingers. Eventually, she could feel her mother holding her hand. But even as the world began to snap into focus, Gina just couldn't move very well on her own. And even though she understood what others were saying to her, she couldn't speak back. Her parents and the nurses at the hospital had to do everything for her, like bathing and feeding her, 
and she would spend two months relearning how to walk and how to say basic words. But Gina was very grateful to be alive. And while her time in the hospital was a total blur, she remembered every detail of how her deadly illness had started. One month before her symptoms had appeared, Gina and her family had gone to Sunday Mass together at St. Patrick's Catholic Church. A few minutes after Mass started, Gina looked up and spotted something small and black flying around the ceiling. It was a little bird who was trying to get outside, but it wasn't moving toward any of the open windows. Instead, it was swooping down towards the pews a little lower each time. Most of the congregation was totally annoyed and kept swatting at it with their hats when it flew down. Then the bird grazed an usher who managed to knock it out of the air with a collection basket, and it fell to the floor and appeared stunned. Gina was an animal lover, and she felt bad for the little bird, so she got up from her seat and hurried to the back of the church, and she scooped it up. But as Gina carried this little bird in her hands, she got a closer look and realized it wasn't a bird, it was a bat. Outside the church, she opened her hands to let it go, but the bat bit her finger hard. Gina almost screamed, but she knew there were little kids watching her from inside the church, and she didn't want to scare them. So she bit her lip and whipped her hand away from the bat, sending it flying across the church lawn. Gina watched as the bat flew away and then cradled her finger. A small pinprick of blood bubbled up where the bat had broke the skin. Gina washed her hands in the bathroom and then snuck back into the church pew beside her parents, smiling as parishioners looked over and flashed grateful looks at her. Gina would tell her parents that the bird was actually a bat, but it never occurred to Gina or her family that the moment the bat's tiny fangs pierced Gina's skin, a lethal pathogen had latched onto one of the nerves in Gina's fingertip. And over the next month, that pathogen replicated and grew, crawling its way up Gina's arm and rooting in her brain. It caused her to have flu-like symptoms, blurred her vision, made her jerk and salivate uncontrollably, and eventually led her to Dr. Willoughby's care. But at that point, it was too late, because Gina now had rabies. Rabies is an acute viral infection that is transmitted to humans by a bite or by the exposure of broken skin to an infected animal's saliva. The most common wild animals that can transmit rabies to people are raccoons, skunks, bats, and foxes. Domestic mammals can also get rabies if they're unvaccinated, like cats, dogs, and cattle. Rabies can be cured with a vaccine, but it must be given within 24 to 72 hours after exposure. If it's left untreated, rabies is fatal. The virus causes significant and progressive damage to the brain and spinal cord, and by the time it's reached the brain, it's almost always too late to prevent death. Victims die painful deaths and experience delirium, abnormal behavior, hallucinations, and insomnia. But thanks to Dr. Willoughby's radical idea, Gina Geese became the first person to survive a case of full-blown rabies without a vaccine. Since then, other doctors have used the technique Dr. Willoughby pioneered to treat rabies patients when they are not eligible for the vaccine. It doesn't work every time, but sometimes the patient does pull through. It's now known as the Milwaukee Protocol. It took Gina two years to restore her language and motor skills, but she finished high school on time with the rest of her class, and then after graduation, she enrolled at Lakeland College to study biology because she wants to work with animals. In one of her classes, Gina studied bats, and over time, her fear of them melted away. Now, she absolutely loves them. On Thursday morning, April 29th, 1993, the sun rose over the high desert of Little Water, New Mexico. The air was crisp and the sky was pink as 21-year-old Florina Woody went for a run with her 19-year-old boyfriend, Merrill Bay. Florina and Merrill were both Navajo and lived in a small rural town on the vast Navajo reservation that sprawls across three southwestern states. Florina loved the majestic landscape surrounding the town and spent as much time as she could outdoors. And she was especially happy to be outside again after a long, wet winter. She and Merrill jogged along the country highway past small houses and trailer homes set back from the road. In the distance, Florina admired the tall red rock cliffs glowing in the sun. The couple turned off the road and headed up a path toward a flat-topped hill called a mesa, 
Usually, the top was dry and dusty, but the wet winter had turned it lush and green and scattered with wildflowers. Once they reached the top, they stopped to look down at the town below. Florina could just make out the trailer home that she and Meryl shared with her parents. It sometimes felt crowded living there together, but she was grateful for their close-knit family, especially since she and Meryl were raising their first child now, a six-month-old son. Florina and Meryl jogged back down the mesa and kept a steady pace the whole way home. Meryl had recently started competing in local races and was always trying to strengthen his endurance. As for Florina, she had reasons to challenge herself too. She'd originally taken up running to offset her asthma, which had gotten better lately. Once they got home, Florina went inside their trailer, she showered, and then she went to relax on the couch. But when she sat down, she noticed her neck and back muscles were aching more than usual. She asked Meryl for a massage, but her muscles still felt sore afterwards. Florina wondered if she might have pulled something during their run, so she tried to take it easy for the rest of the day. Over the weekend and into the following week, Florina's aches and pains did not get better. She developed a cough, too, that felt different than her usual asthma. By Friday, just over a week after she first felt sick, Florina realized her symptoms were not going away with rest, so Merrill made her a doctor's appointment for the next day. On Saturday, May 8th, while Merrill watched the baby, Florina's parents drove her to Crown Point Healthcare Facility, which was located about an hour and a half south and east of their town. It was a commute Florina knew well, since she'd given birth there. Crown Point was a small rural hospital operated by the Indian Health Service with about 10 doctors. Two of the doctors were a married couple named Christine Golnick and Thomas Hennessy, who had helped deliver Florina's baby. Florina's parents parked close to the entrance and walked with her into the lobby. Right away, Florina saw Dr. Golnick's familiar face smiling at her. Florina smiled back and waved. After signing in, she followed Dr. Golnick to an exam room in the back. Dr. Golnick placed a stethoscope on Florina's chest and listened. Then she held her fingers to Florina's wrist and measured her pulse. Florina watched Dr. Golnick's face for a reaction, but her expression remained neutral. The doctor understood why Florina was worried, since her symptoms had persisted for so long. But thankfully, her vitals had come back normal, and so the doctor suspected it was just a bad case of the flu. But considering Florina's history with asthma and her lingering symptoms, Dr. Golnick didn't want to take any chances. She suggested that Florina spend the night at the hospital. In the morning, Dr. Golnick's husband, Dr. Hennessy, could come give a second opinion. Florina resisted at first, since the next day was Mother's Day. She said she wanted to get home and spend it with Merrill and their baby. But Dr. Golnick promised Florina that she could leave once Dr. Hennessy checked up on her the next day. So Florina agreed to stay. She knew that it was better to play it safe, especially because she lived so far from the hospital. She told her parents they could head home for the night, and then she called Merrill. He told her he loved her and promised he'd come get her first thing in the morning once she was discharged. The next morning, Florina woke to a knock at the door. It was Dr. Hennessy, and Florina was glad to see him because now she was feeling worse and she was struggling to catch her breath. Dr. Hennessy listened to her lungs with a stethoscope and frowned. He told Florina that he wanted to take a chest x-ray to get a better look at her lungs. Unfortunately, that meant Florina would have to stay at the hospital a bit longer. Florina was disappointed, but she was also relieved that Dr. Hennessy seemed to be treating her symptoms so seriously. Whatever was going on with her felt much worse than the usual breathing issues she experienced from her asthma, and she was starting to get scared. A few minutes later, a technician wheeled in a mobile x-ray unit and scanned Florina's upper body. While she waited for the results, a nurse brought Florina a phone so she could call Merrill. And when Merrill answered, he told Florina that their baby was napping and they'd just celebrate Mother's Day when she got home that night. Hearing Merrill's voice calmed her down, but Florina still felt helpless and lonely. This was not how she envisioned her first Mother's Day going. A little over an hour later, the x-ray technician brought Florina's test results to Dr. Hennessy. The image showed Florina's lungs all whited out, which meant they were full of fluid. Dr. Hennessy was shocked by what he saw, and he ran to Florina's room. He found her lying there with her eyes half-closed and her mouth ringed with a dry white liquid. She was desperately struggling to breathe. Dr. Hennessy couldn't believe it. 
For a patient this young and athletic to go from healthy to near respiratory failure in 24 hours was unheard of. The doctor immediately called for a helicopter to fly Florina to the University of New Mexico Hospital in Albuquerque, which had a much better equipped intensive care unit. But until the helicopter arrived, Dr. Hennessy had to try everything possible to stabilize her condition. He fitted Florina with an oxygen mask to pump air into her lungs, but within a few moments, she coughed up bloody pink froth. Dr. Hennessy's face turned ashen as he realized what was happening. Florina's lungs were so congested, the extra oxygen was not doing anything. And there was another urgent problem. Florina's blood pressure was dropping rapidly. Dr. Hennessy shouted for a nurse to give Florina IV fluids, and as the medicine entered Florina's body, Dr. Hennessy's eyes shot over to the monitors tracking her vitals. They were still extremely weak. Florina's body just wasn't getting enough oxygen, and her organs were starting to shut down. Getting Florina to breathe was now a matter of life and death. The doctor quickly snapped on a pair of fresh gloves, he grabbed a scalpel from an operating tray, and then took a deep breath to steady himself. And then, when Dr. Hennessy was ready, he carefully cut an incision into Florina's throat and inserted a breathing tube directly into Florina's airway. He heard Florina's heart rate monitor beep rapidly for a few moments, and then it went flat. Florina had gone into cardiac arrest. Dr. Hennessy knew he only had a few seconds left to save her life. He started CPR while the nurse grabbed the defibrillator. Once it was charged, the doctor grabbed the paddles and pressed them to Florina's chest, and then the machine released a bolt of electricity into her body. Florina's heart rate monitor stayed flat, so Dr. Hennessy recharged the defibrillator and sent another shock through Florina's body. Just then, a nurse ran in and told the doctor that the helicopter had just arrived. But, by this point, Dr. Hennessy just shook his head. It was too late. Florina was dead. Later that morning, Florina's fiancé, Merrill, was at home sitting by the baby's crib when his phone rang. He recognized the voice on the other end as one of the doctors from Crown Point Hospital, but the words he was hearing, he just couldn't compute. Something had gone terribly wrong, Florina had died, and no one really knew why. Doctors were running tests, but they had never seen anything like it before. Merrill crumpled to the floor. When he'd kissed Florina goodbye less than 24 hours ago, she'd been a bit under the weather, but it didn't seem serious. He didn't understand how this could have happened. Merrill took a moment to gather himself, then he walked into the kitchen where Florina's parents were having their morning coffee. He tried to tell them what had happened, but the words got stuck in his throat. Then he just closed his eyes, let out a deep breath, and blurted out, Florina is dead. Florina's parents stared at him blankly. Her mother asked him what he was talking about. Tears started streaming out of Merrill's eyes as he explained what the doctors had just told him. Florina really was dead. It had happened extremely fast, and the doctors couldn't do anything to save her. This time, it sunk in, and Florina's parents started sobbing. How could a 21-year-old mother in perfect health just suddenly die? That night, Merrill barely slept, and the next day, he woke up in a fog. Food tasted like nothing. He fed and changed the baby, but it felt mechanical. Everything reminded him of Florina. On Tuesday, May 11th, so two days after Florina died, Merrill woke up feeling weak and sluggish. He felt like it was something more than the physical effects of his grief, and he was concerned after what had happened to his wife. The doctors still didn't know what killed Florina, and Merrill didn't want to take any chances. However, he had a lot of planning to do for Florina's funeral, and he didn't want to drive all the way to the Crown Point Hospital, so he decided to go to the local health clinic instead. Merrill told the doctor there what had happened to Florina and that he was now feeling sick. The doctor agreed that Merrill was right to be cautious, but he said Merrill's situation was different than his wife's. Florina had asthma, and that likely contributed to her very rapid decline. The doctor told Merrill to rest and sent him home with a prescription-strength pain reliever, an antibiotic, and an antiviral medication. Merrill took these medications over the next few days, but none of them seemed to work. 
He felt more exhausted each day, and even worse on Friday, May 14th, which was the day of Florina's funeral. Florina's cousin picked Merrill up at the family's trailer that morning, and then they set off for the 70-mile drive south to Sunset Memorial Park in Gallup, New Mexico, where Florina was going to be buried. But they hadn't been in the car long before Merrill started gasping for air. Now, this was before people carried cell phones, so Merrill's cousin had to pull off the highway at a general store to call 911 on a landline. And while he did that, Merrill stumbled out of the car and lurched around in the parking lot, panicking, while his lips and fingernails started turning blue, and then he just collapsed. Paramedics got to the location quickly and raced Merrill to the Gallup Indian Medical Center, and once they arrived, nurses wheeled his stretcher into the emergency room. But by the time he was inside, Merrill had stopped breathing. The physician on duty, Dr. Bruce Tempest, tried to revive him, but it was no use. He declared Merrill dead upon arrival. Later that day, Dr. Tempest sat slumped in a chair, feeling defeated. He had worked at Gallup Indian Medical Center for 23 years and was widely considered an expert at internal medicine. He'd even been awarded the Indian Health Service Clinician of the Year in 1983. But he had felt powerless being unable to save Merrill's life. As Dr. Tempest signed and dated Merrill's time of death paperwork, an assistant mentioned that the man's fiancée had died too just a week earlier, and like Merrill, she had been in good shape and just declined really quickly. Dr. Tempest felt a wave of fear rise in his chest. Two young, physically fit people didn't just suddenly die of respiratory failure one right after another. Something had to make them sick. As he thought about Merrill's death, Dr. Tempest realized he'd seen other cases like it. In the past six months, he had treated three other young Navajos with fatal respiratory issues. He couldn't help wondering if maybe these deaths were all connected. Whatever had killed Florina and Merrill might have killed the others too. The fact that all of the dead were Navajos living within the same general area led the doctor to suspect that this disease might be contagious. And if he had to guess, it seemed like it spread through the air, since the lungs were the most affected organ in every case. If he was right, this could be the start of an incredibly dangerous outbreak. But before he jumped to any conclusions, he needed to gather more information. Dr. Tempest called Crown Point Medical Center, where Florina had been treated before she died. He explained he had treated her boyfriend and wanted to learn what happened to Florina. The doctors at Crown Point didn't hesitate to share a detailed breakdown of her illness. Afterwards, Dr. Tempest hung up and compared both cases. Florina's sounded exactly like what happened to Merrill. It just didn't make sense to Dr. Tempest. He'd never heard of any disease that behaved like this. Also, during this call, the doctor had learned something else that totally puzzled him. Merrill and Florina's six-month-old son had not gotten sick at all. If this was a contagious airborne disease, the baby would have probably caught it from one of his parents. And why hadn't the grandparents gotten sick either? There was one more thing that was bothering Dr. Tempest. So far, there hadn't been any mild cases of this disease reported. Every single person who got sick died. This disease was unlike anything he had seen before. If it kept spreading, many more people could die. That weekend, Dr. Tempest compiled all the information he could on Florina and Merrill's cases. Then, three days after he pronounced Merrill dead, Dr. Tempest phoned the state health department and told them they had a problem. Eleven days later, Dr. Jeffrey Dutchin was wrapping up his work at the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia, where he investigated dangerous outbreaks of disease. He was still in training at the CDC, and the work was demanding. Now he was looking forward to spending the long Memorial Day weekend with his family. But as he was getting ready to leave, there was a knock on his door. It was Dr. Dutchin's boss, and he had a critical job for him. Something troubling was happening on the Navajo Reservation. Young, healthy people were dying, and no one knew why. Six people had already died from this mystery illness, and four others had been hospitalized. The CDC was sending out a team early tomorrow morning, and his boss wanted Dr. Dutchin to be a part of it. Dr. Dutchin immediately switched gears and started putting documents in his briefcase. 
It didn't matter that he had plans with his family. This was urgent. That night, Dr. Dutchin met with the team that was being sent to the Navajo reservation to go over their plan. Once the meeting ended, he was handed a doctor's bag and opened it up to look at the equipment. Along with the regular tools of his trade, he was surprised to find something completely unexpected, a gas mask. Dr. Dutchin knew that it was too early to know what they were up against, but the signs were not good. The next day, Dr. Dutchin and two other colleagues from the CDC landed in New Mexico and went straight to an emergency conference of over 30 public health officials. Huge whiteboards lined every wall of the conference room scribbled with the names of possible germs and toxins, everything from herpes to heavy metals to pesticides and plagues. The mood was frantic. Dr. Dutchin was overwhelmed by all the theories and potential diseases being proposed. Each theory was discussed and dissected. The more possibilities they ruled out, the more worried Dutchin felt. It meant that the cause of death was either something so rare there were very few experts on it, or it was something entirely new. And the longer researchers took to find answers, the more people could die. In fact, on the same day the conference started, a seemingly healthy teenage Navajo girl had collapsed at a school dance at a state park. She died a few hours later. Her death was a stark reminder that the clock was ticking. There was only so much the gathered scientists could accomplish by looking at whiteboards in a conference room. They needed more data. Dr. Dutchin and his colleagues decided to survey some local residents and gather blood samples from anyone who was willing to participate. Two days after the CDC team arrived, the president of the Navajo Nation, Peterson Za, looked out the window of his office in Window Rock, Arizona. The whole Four Corners area, where Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, and Colorado meet, and where the Navajo live, had turned into a media circus. News vans were crammed into every available space of the parking lot below. Zaw's phone was ringing nonstop with calls from journalists, health officials, and locals asking for information on this mystery disease. Za had nothing to tell any of them, but he hoped that would change soon. The Navajo leader was not participating in the CDC's big conference, although he was keeping tabs on their progress. He'd barely slept over the weekend because he was anxiously waiting for any updates, but from what he'd seen so far, he thought the CDC's investigation and the media attention it brought had not been much help. Zaw's people were terrified, and the outsider's ignorance of Navajo customs was adding to their panic. Newspapers were printing the names of the deceased right away, even though Navajo tradition forbade their names from being spoken or written for four days after they died. This was causing a lot of pain and confusion for the Navajo people. They believed this would prevent the spirit of the dead from properly transitioning to the afterlife. And aggravating the already sensitive situation, some scientists were going right up to people's homes and knocking on the door. They had no idea that Navajo custom required them to wait 30 feet away until they were invited inside. These cultural misunderstandings had led to escalating tension on the reservation, and Zaw was worried about what might happen next. Just then, the phone rang again. It was a Navajo woman from the reservation claiming that some medical researchers were bothering her family. Zaw assured her he would be right there to handle the situation. Zaw hung up, then headed outside. He made his way through the crowd of reporters waiting outside his office. As they shouted questions at him, he promised he'd share any new information with them as soon as he had it. Then he got in his truck and headed to the address the woman on the phone had given him. A few minutes later, Za pulled up to a cluster of low Pueblo buildings that marked the address. The sun was high, barely casting shadows across the dusty ground. Za saw a small crowd shouting at two men who were standing off to the side. Both the men looked rattled and confused. Za assumed they were the scientists that the woman had called him about. The situation looked heated, and he sensed it was about to get out of control. Za got out of his truck and recognized the woman who'd called him. And when she saw him, she ran over to him and explained what was going on. The two scientists had knocked on her door, asking if her family would be willing to donate blood for testing. Za shook his head in disgust. Now he understood why the crowd was so upset. He wove his way through them and walked up to the two scientists. Everyone grew silent as Za introduced himself and explained that the researchers had deeply violated Navajo custom. The scientists' unannounced arrival at the woman's house was considered trespassing by the Navajo people, 
But even more offensive was their request for a blood sample. The Navajo believe that blood is spiritually attached to the body, and giving a blood sample is seen as a grave violation of privacy. The scientists' ignorance of this cultural belief was an insult to this woman. The scientists' faces turned red, and they apologized profusely. They said they were there on official business researching the outbreak and did not mean to offend anyone. Za cautioned them to be more careful. He wanted to stop this outbreak as much as they did, but if the scientists could not get people to trust them, then they certainly would never learn what caused this disease. The scientists apologized again and packed up to leave. Za calmed the crowd and told the woman to call if any other strange people came around. He had a feeling that there was more trouble to come. Back at his office that same day, Za read the latest news on the outbreak with growing discouragement. The Navajo people weren't just facing problems on the reservation. People in the wider area were beginning to shun them out of fear of the disease. There were several articles about Navajo families being banned from local restaurants and businesses. There was even a report about 27 Navajo third graders from Chinle, Arizona being denied a field trip to visit pen pals at another school in California. And worse, people were still dying. The death toll was now up to 10, and many more were very sick. Za's eyes locked on one particular article about the outbreak in the Washington Post. A particular phrase in the opening paragraph immediately jumped out at him. It said, quote, the Navajo flu. He slammed the newspaper down on his desk and rubbed his temples. This had gone far enough. He called in his assistant and told her to schedule a leadership council meeting immediately. The next day, Dr. Ben Muneta, an Indian Health Services doctor in New Mexico, received a call from Zah's assistant inviting him to a meeting that night in Window Rock, Arizona, about the outbreak. Dr. Muneta understood why he was being asked to go. His grandfather had been a famous medicine man in the tribe. He had inspired Dr. Muneta to become a Stanford-trained physician with a unique knowledge of both modern science and traditional Navajo medicine. Dr. Mineta had been at the CDC's conference and could be a bridge between their investigation and the Navajo people. He told the assistant he'd be there. As he drove to Window Rock, Dr. Mineta passed a sign nailed to a telephone pole that said, quote, No media allowed, no newspaper, TV, radio, etc. This means you, end quote. He could tell the locals were clearly fed up with the negative attention. His thoughts turned to his colleague at the CDC, Jeffrey Dutchin. Dr. Dutchin and the other scientists were doing their best to solve this mystery, but they needed help from the Navajo. He hoped that this meeting he was going to have with President Za was the start of that. A few minutes later, Dr. Mineta arrived at Za's office and was led to a small conference room. Dr. Mineta realized this wouldn't be anything like the CDC's giant conference. It was an intentionally small meeting that left out the federal researchers altogether. Za didn't want them interfering in Navajo business. Aside from Za, there were a few senior Navajo medicine men in attendance. The only other physician in the room was the state's deputy commissioner of health. Once everyone was seated, President Za asked Dr. Mineta to update them on how the investigation was going so far. Dr. Mineta admitted that the CDC hadn't found much yet, but they were testing freely given blood samples for all kinds of diseases and working through all the possibilities. Dr. Mineta then turned to the medicine men and asked them for their prayers. The eldest medicine man was grateful for Dr. Mineta's request, but instead of prayers, he offered his own interpretation of the mystery disease outbreak. He believed that too many young Navajo were abandoning traditional practices such as speaking the language and living off the land. They were neglecting ceremonies that were meant to heal the sick, bring good fortune, and celebrate life's milestones. One of the most important of these is called the Blessing Way, which is performed for newborns, brides and grooms, and people who are sick or who have experienced a traumatic event. Without these traditions to keep the world in balance, death was sure to follow. Dr. Moneta could sense the medicine man was holding something back. 
However, it would be improper for him to press his elder for more information. According to Navajo custom, if Dr. Mineta wanted more knowledge, he had to partake in a ceremony that lasted for several days. As much as Dr. Mineta wanted to adhere to tradition, he knew there was no time to waste. He gathered himself, then sat up straight and looked at the eldest medicine man. In a quiet but very firm voice, Dr. Mineta asked if the medicine man could just tell him more. For a long moment, the medicine man just stared at him. Dr. Mineta felt a knot growing in the pit of his stomach. He knew how upset the Navajos already were that the investigators were violating their customs, and now Dr. Mineta, who knew better, had done it as well. Finally, the medicine man spoke. He acknowledged that Dr. Mineta's behavior was irregular, but considering the gravity of the situation, he agreed to say more, and immediately Dr. Mineta let out a sigh of relief. According to the elder, this was not the first time a deadly illness like this had struck the Navajo. There had been two other bouts of mysterious respiratory failure deaths in their community. One was in 1918, and the other was in 1933. It was a long time ago, but stories were still told among the Navajo about those who had died. Dr. Mineta asked if there had been anything similar about the years in question. The medicine man nodded. Both had been unseasonably wet winters with lots of rain, just like this recent one. Then he described how water changed the land, and these changes in turn brought a creature that carried death. Dr. Muneta knew what the medicine man was referring to. The creature was a real animal that was a prominent figure in Navajo mythology. Navajo called it Na'at's Unse and believed it was equally capable of spreading life or death. In Navajo legend, if Na'at's Unse entered a home and saw people being wasteful, it would then choose the Navajo's strongest young people to die. Muneta thought about what the medicine man revealed. The doctor didn't think that this animal was literally passing judgment on the Navajo and killing them, and in real life, he'd never heard of it spreading a disease like this through contact with humans. But as he considered the possibility, he came up with a theory that explained how it could happen. And if he was right, it would completely explain this deadly outbreak. Dr. Mineta raced back home and called his CDC colleague, Jeffrey Dutchen, who had led the emergency conference the week before. Dutchen was relieved to hear that the disease was not completely new, but he was confused when Dr. Mineta explained that the outbreak was related to the rain. This land had experienced every type of weather over time. Rain was not unusual, but this disease was. Dr. Mineta told him that it wasn't the rain itself. It was the animal from Navajo legends that came as a result of the rain. And if they were going to solve this mystery, then they would need to find as many of these creatures as possible. Dr. Mineta could sense Dr. Dutchen hesitate, but so far, nothing else had worked, and as strange as this theory was about mythical creatures, it was the most promising lead they had. And so Dr. Dutchen told Dr. Mineta he'd get a team together right away. And this time, he'd make sure the investigators respected the Navajo's cultural practices. Three days later, Dr. Dutchen walked out of his hotel a few miles south of the Navajo reservation. He'd organized this investigation with the help of President Za, and it would be conducted with the help and guidance of medicine men and other Navajo representatives. Dr. Dutchen scanned the parking lot and spotted four men gathered around a couple of beat-up trucks. Dr. Dutchen smiled and headed over to them. They were the CDC experts sent to trap the animals that Dr. Mineta had told him about. Another car pulled up next to them, and a stocky Navajo man climbed out. He was an environmental health expert sent by President Za to help with the investigation. He clapped Dr. Dutchen on the back and promised he'd help them find what they were looking for. Dr. Dutchen felt a surge of hope. Thanks to the Navajos, he believed they knew what was making people sick. Now they'd be able to track down that creature that was spreading disease around the area, and hopefully they could figure out how to treat the illness before it killed anyone else. They all piled into a truck and headed for the Navajo Reservation. The next day, Dr. Dutchen stood in the middle of the desert. He was dressed in full biohazard gear, a silver suit, airtight helmet, and heavy boots and gloves. He looked across the desert landscape at the other members of his team, they were all dressed in the same protective gear. To outside observers, they might have all looked like astronauts from a movie set. 
But the work they were doing was very real, and if they weren't careful, it could be very dangerous. Dr. Dutchin was standing above a trap he'd set the day before. Before he checked it, he made sure the wind was blowing away from him to avoid inhaling any harmful particles. If he caught an infected animal, he could be at serious risk for picking up this disease. Once Dr. Dutchin was certain that he was safe, he cautiously bent down and examined the trap. Through the thick material of his helmet, he could hear a faint sound coming from inside, the sounds of a trapped animal. He looked over to his colleagues, who were also examining their traps. Dr. Dutchin hoped that at least one of them had caught what they were looking for. Over the next few days, Dr. Dutchin and his team caught all sorts of animals. They carefully took samples and sent them off to the CDC in Atlanta for analysis. On June 16th, four days after the specimens arrived in Atlanta, Dr. Dutchin got his confirmation. The disease afflicting the Navajo wasn't entirely new. It was called a hantavirus. But this strain of hantavirus was entirely unique. The CDC had not been able to identify it earlier because it typically attacks the kidneys, while this particular strain affected people's lungs. But thanks to the tip from the Navajo's medicine men, the CDC scientists knew what was spreading the disease. It was the creature known as the Naats Unse. When Dr. Mineta met with President Za and the medicine men, they told him how this real-life animal played a prominent role in the Navajo's origin myth. According to Navajo legend, the creature is responsible for spreading the seeds of life across the world. However, it can also be dangerous and its breath can be fatal. This animal is incredibly common in North America, but the Navajo fear it so intensely they burn their clothes if it even touches them. Individually, this animal is not a huge threat, because each one doesn't carry enough of the hantavirus to endanger anyone. But if there's enough of them, they can spread disease like wildfire. In that winter, the heavy rains in the Four Corners area created a concentrated population of the animal that had only occurred twice before, in 1918 and in 1933. In all three instances, the heavy rains had led to more plants and vegetation. This in turn fed the creature and allowed them to multiply. The creature then infiltrated the homes of Navajo people like Florina Woody and Merrill Bay, leaving traces of the hantavirus everywhere they went. The creature that was responsible for spreading this disease was the humble deer mouse. And a hantavirus is a family of viruses spread mainly by rodents. And that spring, deer mice had been all over the Navajo reservation and surrounding area. They crept into homes, they nested in sheds, barns, and storage units. No matter how many holes were plugged or traps were laid, there were just too many of them to stop. And wherever they went, they left their droppings, which carried the deadly virus. When people like Florina and Merrill tried to clean those areas, they came into direct contact with the droppings, and the virus entered their bodies in high enough concentrations to infect them. But now that the CDC knew what was behind the outbreak, local officials could reduce the danger. After the deer mouse was identified as the culprit, public health advisories urged people to avoid rodents and told them how to make it harder for them to enter their homes. And while that didn't eliminate the danger entirely, it reduced it enough to help the outbreak end by the middle of August, almost three months after Florina Woody died. All told, 24 people in the Four Corners area were infected with this previously unknown virus. Tragically, half of them died. But thanks to the cooperation between the CDC and the Navajo people, the damage was limited and there have been very few outbreaks since then. In keeping with the Navajo custom of not speaking the names of the dead, the CDC decided to call this North American hantavirus strain Sin Nombre, which means without a name. In the summer of 1983, a middle-aged Italian man held his mother's hands as they swayed about on a dance floor. His mother was in her 90s and was not able to get out very much, so this was an extremely special occasion. And this particular dance floor was on a cruise ship sailing on the Mediterranean Sea. It was an unbelievable experience he knew they would never forget. Then a slow song came on, and as they danced together, the man began to feel abnormally hot. Sweat ran down his chest and underneath his tuxedo jacket, his hair stuck to his neck, and when he touched his forehead, his hand came away wet. He told his mother he'd be right back, 
and then he left the dance floor, took off his jacket, and walked to the cruise deck, hoping the ocean breeze would cool him down. But when he got up there, he didn't cool down, and instead he just kept on sweating until his dress shirt was completely drenched. The man finally just ran to a bathroom in one of the cruise ship's long hallways, and he ran right over to the sink, turned on the cold water, and splashed it on his face. But when he looked up at his reflection, he couldn't believe what he was seeing. Not because of how much he was sweating, but because when he looked at his eyes, he could see his pupils had shrunk to two tiny pinpricks. Suddenly, he knew exactly what was wrong. He stared at his sweaty reflection and told himself he would go back out there on the dance floor and he would enjoy this night with his mother. He had to make every second count, because he was certain he'd be dead within a year. From Ballin Studios and Wondery, I'm Mr. Ballin, and this is Mr. Ballin's Medical Mysteries, where every week we will explore a new baffling mystery originating from the one place we all can't escape, our own bodies. If you like today's story, please take the follow button on a 70-hour cross-country road trip and insist on only listening to Christmas music the entire time. This episode is called The Curse of Veneto. On a spring evening in 1978, a 48-year-old man named Silvano walked through the doors of a grand Italian palazzo. Silvano was in this big, gorgeous house to celebrate someone's birthday, though he wasn't exactly sure whose birthday it was. This wasn't unusual for Silvano. He came from one of the most prominent families in the Veneto region, so his calendar was often packed with all kinds of galas and parties and charity events. And he never passed up an opportunity to slick back his bright red hair and dress in his favorite tuxedo. As Silvano made his way to the bar, he noticed people looking at him and whispering to each other. He tried not to pay any mind to it. Everyone in his family was the subject of gossip and rumors. It was something he'd grown up with his entire life. So Silvano ignored the chatter while he got his drink and then went to join some friends. While they talked, he caught the eye of a beautiful woman across the room. And instead of turning away or whispering to her friends, the woman smiled. Silvano smiled back. He'd always had a lot of success with dating, and he loved the bachelor lifestyle. So he excused himself from his friends and began walking in the woman's direction. But before he reached her, somebody grabbed his arm. Silvano turned to see who it was, and he saw it was his niece's husband, Ignazio. And he was out of breath, his hair was a mess, and his clothes were totally disheveled. And he told Silvano that something was terribly wrong with Silvano's sister. Silvano kept a calm expression on his face, but inside he was panicking, because he knew exactly what was wrong with his sister. He told Ignazio to bring him to his sister right away, and the two men hurried off out of the party. About half an hour later, Silvano was by his sister's bedside, and she was curled up in her pajamas, totally drenched in sweat. Silvano bent down to ask how she was feeling, and when she turned to look at him, her pupils were so small he could barely see them. She stared in his direction for a moment, and then just shook her head. Tears slowly filled Silvano's eyes. He knew what that look meant. His sister had been struck by the family curse. A few months later, in early 1979, Silvano and the rest of his family stood at his sister's grave for her funeral. His mother gripped his arm, sobbing into his chest, while the priest performed the eulogy. Silvano was stricken with grief as well, but now his eyes were dry. He felt like he'd been mourning his sister ever since that night when he found out she was sick. He just didn't have any more tears to cry. He held tightly onto his mother, doing his best to offer her comfort. He whispered to her that there was nothing anyone could have done. After all, nobody survives the family curse. At this, Silvano's mother snapped her head up, glaring at him with red-rimmed eyes. She hissed at him to never speak of that again. Otherwise, he, Silvano, could be struck by this curse that had just killed his sister and had killed his father, his grandfather, and countless other relatives dating all the way back to the 1700s. Silvano apologized and his mother nodded and then she nestled her head back into his chest. Silvano spent the rest of the funeral in stoic silence, 
As his sister's casket was lowered into the ground, Silvano couldn't help picturing what his own funeral would look like when this curse inevitably killed him. After his sister died, Silvano threw himself completely into his work. He managed a very successful construction company and spent all his time organizing projects and visiting job sites. One of his remaining living sisters, who lived with Silvano, had to constantly remind him to eat and drink, and then whenever he had a social event, she had to remind him to attend it. For the next few years, that was what Silvano's life was like. Basically work 24-7. But by 1983, four years after his sister had died, Silvano was completely exhausted. He knew he needed a break. So that summer, he decided to surprise his mother with a cruise on the Mediterranean Sea. And it would turn out it would be just what he needed. The warm air was invigorating, and every evening there was a new party for Silvano to attend. But on the last night of the cruise, disaster struck. Silvano was dancing with his mother when he suddenly felt overheated. He could feel his skin sticking to the shirt underneath his tuxedo jacket. His mother pulled away from him and asked if he was okay, and Silvano nodded and said he was fine, he just needed to go cool off for a minute. Silvano's pulse raced as he ran to the bathroom. He knew this was not just a simple case of overexerting himself, and when he looked into the mirror, his pinprick-sized pupils confirmed his worst fear. The family curse had indeed come for him too and he was all too familiar with what happened next. First, he would stop being able to sleep, his mind would begin to deteriorate, and he'd lose his grip on reality, and then shortly after that, he'd be dead. And there was nothing anyone could do about it. After the cruise was over, Silvano considered telling his mother and sister that he very likely had been afflicted by the family curse, but ultimately, he decided against it. There was nothing they could do to stop this curse from killing him, and so he just didn't want them to worry. But it was very difficult for Silvano to hide his symptoms from his family, especially his sister who lived with him. He kept having to change clothes because he sweated through them so quickly, he rarely made eye contact with her because he didn't want her to see his pupils, and at night when he laid in bed unable to sleep, he was too scared to get out of his bed and do anything because he was worried his sister would hear him walking around. About six months after the cruise, Silvano sat at his desk in his home office. He'd been avoiding going to work in person because he didn't want anyone to notice his illness. The clock read 3 p.m., but Silvano had already put in a long day because he had been up working since 4 o'clock that morning. Even though he'd been working for 11 hours straight, Silvano did not feel tired. He just felt hot. He grabbed a piece of paper off his desk and used it to fan himself. Silvano knew the curse was only going to get worse, but there really wasn't anything he could do to stop it. So he figured, why worry about it? He didn't even call a doctor. He'd rather keep trying to live his life than cry over something he couldn't change. Just then, Silvano's sister rounded the corner into his office. He immediately dropped the paper, hoping she had not noticed him fanning himself, and she asked if he was going to take a break to eat. But he told her he was just too busy. She stood there, staring at him. He could tell she didn't believe him. Finally, she sighed and left the room. For a second, Silvano thought about getting up and following her down the hall and letting her in on his declining health, but before he could, his phone rang, so he answered it. It was his niece's husband, Ignazio. He asked Silvano if he'd come over for dinner that evening. Silvano didn't have any other plans, so he said, sure. Silvano hung up the phone and pushed the stack of papers aside and then stood up. He'd already sweat through all of his clothes, so he'd need to shower and change. He quietly opened his office door and tiptoed to his bedroom, being extra careful not to make any noise, in fear that his sister might come find him and see his drenched clothing. Silvano hated having to sneak through the house, but he didn't know what else to do. He promised himself that he would tell his sister what was going on as soon as he could find the right words. That evening, Silvano arrived at Ignazio and his niece Elisabetta's house with his red hair neatly brushed and a pocket square tucked into his suit. Silvano shook Ignazio's hand and gave Elisabetta a hug. He kept a smile on his face, but as he did, he worried they would see how sweaty he already was. As they led him down the hallway to the kitchen, Silvano caught a glimpse of himself in the mirror, and he looked terrible. He'd done everything he could to clean up, 
but there was just no hiding the sweat on his brow or the dark circles under his eyes or his tiny, tiny pupils. Silvano looked away from his reflection and took a seat at the table. Ignazio filled three glasses with red wine and Elisabetta brought a large dinner salad to the table. Silvano had barely taken one bite before Ignazio made him wish he had not come over at all. Ignazio asked Silvano how he'd been sleeping. Silvano knew exactly what that meant. Either he had not hidden his symptoms well enough, or maybe his sister, who lived with him, maybe she noticed the curse was creeping up on him and told the family. Silvano sipped his wine and admitted he had not been sleeping much. But it was okay. He was using the extra time to get more work done. The only thing that bothered him was that his sex drive had disappeared. He said that to be funny, but Ignazio and Elisabetta did not laugh. Ignazio's expression was grave. He said he'd gotten access to the local parish records, which contained information about the family going back to the 18th century. He discovered that throughout the generations, Silvano's ancestors had frequently died young, and the records said they died from all kinds of strange disorders and diseases. Things like epilepsy, fever, meningitis, dementia, various brain diseases, and schizophrenia. As for the death of Silvano's sister, that had been attributed to familial encephalitis, which is a type of brain disease. But Ignacio said he didn't think any of those things were actually the thing that killed them. He was certain they had all died from the family curse. But of course, family curse would not be an acceptable cause of death. Even in the 1700s, they would not put that down as the thing that killed someone. Ignacio believed the real disease that was wiping out members of this family was some kind of rare genetic condition originating in the brain, one that nobody had ever been able to identify. He begged Silvano to please seek help from a neurologist before it was too late. Silvano leaned back and crossed his arms. He felt betrayed, like this dinner had been a setup just to ambush him. He told Ignacio he didn't want help. He'd seen his sisters poked and prodded by doctors before invariably they still just passed away. Going to a neurologist would only cause more pain and more frustration. But Ignacio would not take no for an answer. He said he knew a neurologist in a nearby town, it'd be a quick visit, and if nothing else, the doctor might be able to prescribe something that could help Silvano sleep even a little bit. Silvano shrugged and then finished his wine in a single gulp, and then he said, okay, fine, I'll go, but only if you don't ask me to do anything else after this. A few days later, Silvano sat in the passenger seat of Ignazio's car as they drove on the thin roads of the Veneto region, passing by fields of grazing cattle, intricate Gothic buildings, and canals full of clear water. The view was beautiful, but Silvano was too anxious to enjoy it. He did not believe this neurologist was going to be able to help him, but there was still a part of him deep down that did hope he could be cured. They pulled up to the neurologist's office, parked, and walked inside. While they checked in with the receptionist, Silvano felt like he was being watched by the other patients in the waiting room. As usual, Silvano tried to ignore their curious looks, but now it was harder for him to do. His family's curse and the trail of early deaths left behind was an open secret within this community. He could sense them evaluating him to see if he might be suffering from this curse too. After a few uncomfortable minutes in the waiting area, Silvano and Ignacio were called back to an exam room. A young neurologist came in and Silvano explained his symptoms, unusual sweating, tiny pupils, low sex drive, and difficulty sleeping. Silvano was on edge as he watched the neurologist think. The doctor said he wasn't sure what to make of the sweating and the size of Silvano's pupils, but the lack of sleep could be a result of anxiety or depression. The neurologist prescribed Silvano a sedative. He said it might not cure him, but it should help him rest. Just like that, Silvano's hope dissolved. He'd known this appointment would be useless. Feeling disappointed, he stood up and thanked the doctor, then he and Ignacio left the office and headed home. The next evening, Ignacio was in his bed with his wife when his phone rang. He pushed the covers back and walked to the receiver, and when he picked it up, he heard Silvano's sister's frantic voice on the other end. She told Ignacio to come over quickly, then the line went dead. Ignacio figured this must have something to do with Silvano and the family curse, so he rushed to his car and sped over to his uncle-in-law's house. When he got there, he flung open the door and raced inside. 
Silvano's sister was right inside the house in the entryway, and her eyes were wide as she watched her brother, Silvano, who was right across from her at the base of the stairs. Silvano wore black silk pajamas that were totally drenched in sweat, and he was hunched over slightly, moving his arms like he was trying to pick up objects and move them, except his hands were empty. It was like he wasn't even aware of what he was doing, or aware of anyone else in the room. Silvano's sister whispered to Ignazio that she'd heard a commotion in Silvano's room, and when she went to investigate, she saw Silvano sitting up in bed doing this weird military-style salute, and then without a word, he'd just gotten up, walked right past her, and marched down the stairs. And so Silvano's sister had no idea what was happening or what to do. Ignacio reassured her that probably Silvano was just sleepwalking and so was not in any sort of danger. Then Ignacio walked over to his uncle-in-law and he kind of shook his shoulder, at which point Silvano woke up, acted very confused, and then said he'd been dreaming about packing a suitcase. Ignacio glanced from Silvano to Silvano's sister and then he told both of them that, you know, it seems like the sedative Silvano is taking is probably leading to sleepwalking. And so because sleepwalking can be quite hazardous, it's probably best that Silvano stop taking the sedative. Ignacio was naturally very worried about Silvano. Even though the first neurologist really had not worked out at all, Ignacio felt even more determined to find someone who could maybe help Silvano get better. But while Ignacio looked for another doctor, Silvano's symptoms just got worse and worse. He had not been sleeping well for months, and the exhaustion was totally getting to him. In March of 1984, so about a month after the sleepwalking episode, Silvano tried to go into the office to work. He wore cool, comfortable clothing and acted like everything was perfectly normal. But when one of his employees asked him a very simple question, it was like Silvano's brain couldn't process it, and so he literally couldn't answer. And then later, when Silvano tried to just write his name on a document, his hands were so shaky that his signature looked totally wrong. And a few times he tried to speak to his colleagues, and the words came out slurred and totally incoherent. Silvano knew he could not continue to work like this. As much as he wanted to cling to his normal life, he knew his normal life was over. So he walked into his boss's office and quit his job. As he packed up his belongings, Silvano had to face the facts. He was dying. It was heartbreaking and infuriating to know that he would succumb to the same illness that had been killing his family for centuries. But Silvano had changed his mind about one thing. He knew he was going to die, but he didn't just want to wait for death. Instead, he wanted to do everything he could to try to learn about his illness and so that maybe he could prevent other family members from getting this family curse. Silvano hated the idea of seeing another doctor, but now he needed one. He went home that afternoon and called Ignazio, and to Silvano's relief, Ignazio said he'd actually already found the perfect neurologist. The next morning, a renowned sleep expert named Dr. Elio Lugarezzi welcomed Ignazio and Silvano to the University of Bologna's Neurological Institute in the bustling city of Bologna, Italy. Dr. Lugarezzi greeted Ignazio and then went to shake Silvano's hand, but Silvano, for a second, just stood there staring blankly like he didn't understand what was going on, and then suddenly he kind of snapped out of it and reached out and shook the doctor's hand. After that, Dr. Lugaresi led the men down a long, decorated hallway into his office. The doctor sat at a large, organized desk and motioned for Ignazio and Silvano to take the seats across from him. Then, once they were seated, he asked Silvano what was going on. In an eerily calm and quiet voice, Silvano said he was going to die, and he knew exactly how it was going to happen. Currently, he said he was having trouble sleeping, but he was still getting maybe two or three hours of rest every night. But eventually, he knew he would stop sleeping altogether, and then he would develop hallucinations, and then eventually, the exhaustion would kill him. Ignacio leaned forward and explained that Silvano's illness actually ran in his family. Two of Silvano's sisters had died from this condition, so had his father, grandfather, and various ancestors going back more than two centuries. Dr. Lugaresi eyed Silvano carefully. He'd been studying sleep for over 20 years, and he'd never heard of any condition like this. But Dr. Lugaresi was very confident in his abilities as a sleep specialist, and so he assured Silvano they could find a treatment. But Silvano just shook his head and said there really was no treatment, 
However, even though he knew he was doomed, he wanted to try to help his family as best as he could. And so he asked Dr. Lugaresi to please study him until he died, and then after he died, take his brain and study it and try to figure out what this curse really is. Dr. Lugaresi stared at Silvano, and then glanced over at Ignacio, who looked just as desperate as Silvano, and then the neurologist just nodded. He told Silvano to go home, pack up everything he needed to live at the Neurological Institute, and then come back that evening. And then, after Silvano and Ignacio left, Dr. Lugaresi and his team set up the laboratory observation room where Silvano would live. The room was small and nondescript, and had a bed in one corner and a video camera in the other. The video camera would allow doctors to record Silvano's every move. Hopefully, this would allow them to figure out what Silvano's illness really was, and who knows, maybe they might even be able to cure him. Silvano returned that evening wearing his black silk pajamas and carrying a suitcase that contained clothes and toiletries. As he stared at the building in front of him, he realized this was the place he was almost certainly going to die. Dr. Lugaresi met Silvano at the door and led him back to the observation room where he'd be staying. Silvano sat at the edge of the bed while a team of neurologists hooked him up to all kinds of monitors. A sensor around his arm measured his blood pressure, a thin band on his other arm kept track of his body temperature, a piece of plastic clamped onto his finger counted his pulse. Lastly, Dr. Lugaresi pulled out this sort of tight, stretchy hat and told Silvano to put it on. It looked kind of like a swim cap, except it was covered in small black circular sensors and cords. Silvano pulled it on, and two flaps of fabric hung down on either side of his face. As Dr. Lugaresi velcroed the fabric together beneath Silvano's chin, he explained that Silvano was wearing an electrode sensor cap. It was there to track and record electrical signals in Silvano's brain, which would hopefully give Dr. Lugaresi some insight into why he couldn't sleep. Silvano figured he looked absolutely ridiculous, but now is not the time to be concerned with his appearance. He was doing this to help his family. Dr. Lugaresi told Silvano he would be constantly watching him and monitoring his vital signs. Then he turned and left, and Silvano was all alone in his new bedroom. Silvano laid down and closed his eyes. The oxygen monitor dug into his finger, and the electrode sensor cap pressed into the back of his head. He couldn't get comfortable, especially when he knew a camera was watching him. But it didn't really matter. Whether Silvano was here or at home, he didn't think he was going to get any sleep. So he laid on the bed and stared up at the tile ceiling. But the longer he looked, the fuzzier his vision got. And then the seemingly random patterns on the ceiling tiles started to morph and shift into shapes and faces. Silvano knew he was hallucinating, which came with the family curse, but he couldn't do anything about it so he decided he would just enjoy the show. From outside the room, Dr. Lugaresi watched a screen that showed data from Silvano's monitors. On the screen, a series of lines spiked, dipped, and flattened out, depending on the electrical signals in Silvano's brain. Dr. Lugaresi watched the screen, getting more and more confused. The data from Silvano's brain did not look like anything he had ever seen before. People typically had one electrical pattern when they were awake, and another quite different pattern when they were sleeping. But Silvano's results didn't match either of them. He was in some kind of in-between state, not awake, but not asleep. Dr. Lugaresi watched through the window as Silvano moved his arms up and down over his head. It looked like he was going through the motions of combing his hair, except his hands were empty and his head was totally covered in wires. Whatever was going on, it was not typical sleepwalking. Silvano would eventually fall asleep, but only for an hour. When he woke up, Dr. Lugaresi checked his various monitors. Silvano's body temperature was abnormally high, his breathing was irregular, and his heart rate was erratic. Dr. Lugaresi glanced at his colleagues, and they looked just as confused as he felt. Dr. Lugaresi didn't know what any of these symptoms meant or how they might be related. He realized that solving this mystery might be a lot harder than he'd anticipated. One morning, about a month into his stay at the Neurological Institute, Silvano sat upright in bed, staring into space. Over the past few weeks, his mind had begun to deteriorate. 
He spent almost all of his time in that in-between state where he wasn't quite sleeping or quite awake. Without regular sleep, every day kind of bled into the next one, and so Silvano lost track of time. He would look around the hospital room to try to ground himself to figure out what was going on, but he couldn't get his eyes to focus. Sometimes Silvano was vaguely aware of Dr. Lugaresi asking him some questions, but the doctor's voice sounded garbled and far away. That morning, as he sat awake staring at nothing, Silvano actually started to feel tired. And just as he thought he was finally going to get a little bit of sleep, his head just jerked right back up. And then he felt tired, and so he started to drift off, but then again, his head snapped back up. It was like his body was actively rejecting sleep. Frustrated, Silvano pushed himself out of bed with his weak, shaky arms, and then he just began shuffling around the room with no idea where he was trying to go or what he was trying to do. It took all of his strength to put one foot in front of the other, but it was better than trying to sleep unsuccessfully. As Dr. Lugaresi watched Silvano pace around in his room, the doctor decided he had to do something to help. He went into the room and gently led Silvano back over to his bed, and then once he was sitting down, he injected him with a sedative. And as soon as he did, Silvano's pulse and blood pressure plummeted. He almost stopped breathing. Dr. Lugaresi's stomach dropped. The sedatives had sent Silvano into a coma. Panicked, he administered more medications to undo the effect of the sedative, and these medications did bring Silvano out of the coma and put him back into that kind of trance-like state he was in. Dr. Lugaresi didn't know what to do. Silvano had always told him that there was no cure for this family curse, but Dr. Lugaresi had really wanted to prove him wrong. But now, after a month of monitoring Silvano, the doctor still could not give him a proper diagnosis, let alone help him get better. Dr. Lugaresi was really starting to feel helpless. Another month later, Dr. Lugaresi sat next to Silvano's bedside. Silvano was practically comatose, a totally blank expression on his face, until out of nowhere, he wrapped his arms around his legs and started screaming as loud as he could. To Dr. Lugaresi, it was like all of Silvano's pent-up pain and frustration was now finally just coming out. The worst part was, this seemed to be the last bit of energy left in Silvano. Over the next few weeks, Dr. Lugaresi watched as Silvano became less and less aware of the world around him. He quit eating, he quit moving, and so Dr. Lugaresi knew Silvano was dying, and there was nothing he could do to stop it. Silvano passed away in the laboratory observation room. Just as he'd predicted, he died nine months after that night on the cruise ship when he first noticed symptoms of the family curse developing. Dr. Lugaresi kept the promise he'd made to Silvano. Immediately after he died, a pathologist removed Silvano's brain and it was shipped to a neurological specialist in America. And what that specialist discovered in Silvano's brain shocked Dr. Lugaresi. The thalamus is a small walnut-shaped structure located near the center of the brain. It helps us process sensory information and plays a vital role in consciousness and maintaining our regular sleeping and waking cycles. And Silvano's thalamus was full of holes. It literally looked like worms had just bored right through it. Large portions of his thalamus had just been totally destroyed. Dr. Lugaresi had never seen anything like this before. In fact, this was a new disease, and it would be named Fatal Familial Insomnia. In 1986, Dr. Lugaresi published his findings, detailing Silvano's illness and introducing his family's curse to the scientific community. Based on further research with Silvano's relatives, Dr. Lugaresi eventually determined fatal familial insomnia is caused by malfunctioning proteins which attack the thalamus. As the thalamus is destroyed, the brain loses the ability to regulate the body and the mind. This leads to total insomnia, like literally they cannot sleep anymore, which eventually causes death. The chances of the average person developing fatal insomnia are about one in a million. But in Silvano's family, where the disease had been passed down genetically through generations, the chances were one in two. In 1986, Silvano and his relatives were the only known people suffering from fatal familial insomnia in the world. In the years since, researchers have found about 50 other families with the same disorder. 
There are currently no effective treatments for fatal familial insomnia. It's a death sentence. But doctors do still continue to research the disease in hopes of someday finding a cure. 